So in Sharp Objects episode three, called Fix, we learn a ton about Amma. So the episode opens with Amma drinking in the woods with a bunch of her friends, running after a pig that she clearly let loose, hinted at later in this episode when she goes to the barn. And then when Amma gets home, she runs over the mother's roses. She's clearly inebriated. And she goes up to Camille's room and she has some really important lines here. So Amma this episode, we're starting to see more of her dark side and she became more unlikable here. And it started right from this line. And then she starts kind of trying to get in the mind of Camille. And she's like, you love dead girls. You just couldn't stay away. So what is that even supposed to mean? So already Emma's coming off more rude than she ever has to Camille in this episode. So then we get to the juice of this episode where it flashes now to where we learn about who this mystery girl we've been seeing in flashes on the train with the bloody mouth is. And it's Sydney Sweeney's character of Alice. And it opens up with a really cool shot, how it transitioned so well from the scene with Emma and Camille hugging each other in the rain to Camille now in the car in the rain and she has a razor in her hand and she's cutting herself and now she's checking into this rehab center. And when she gets into this rehab center, you're already getting hints now how important this area is gonna be for her because in her previous flashbacks, we saw the janitor walking, we hear the music she always listens to on her iPod in the background. And then you see Alice, so it connects right there like, okay, this character of Alice, this environment she's in is gonna be super significant to her character building we've already been hinted at. So Alice is this girl with a beanie, ripped up jeans, very standoffish to Camille at first, but Camille tries to get her to open up by showing her cuts on her belly that look to say F you up. What I love about the show is that that set up this whole episode to have really good backstory about Alice and Camille's relationship. And I love how it smoothly cuts to current time where Camille is on the phone with her editor and he says the piece wasn't bad that she wrote and he's putting on the website. So right now you're already building fear from last week's ending where she left that she went into Natalie's room in the piece, which could really hurt the editor. And he does not know that because she lied to him and said she got permission. So then we go to a really good scene, probably Detective Willis's best scene yet, where it opens up him frustrated in the car outside the police station. And it's so cool because it's showing us flashbacks to something that just happened right before us seeing him frustrate in the car. So it's as recent of a flashback as you can go and it's very effective. It felt refreshing in a way, how that played out with him walking around, looking outside at the murder scenes, really pissed off, thinking about Vickery and it going back to his argument with Vickery and you're, you're figuring out through that storytelling what exactly happened. And Vickery is one of the most difficult characters right now. He believes it's an out of towner, a trucker or a Mexican, but Detective Willis knows nine out of 10 murder victims know their killer. So in any case, the odds of that are very slim. And then it gets super confrontational and Detective Willis has a great line here where he's like, someone had a particular problem with these girls. Does any specific Mexican you have fit that profile bill? killer line and I'm already starting to love Detective Willis. He reminds me of the actor of John Bernthal. He's hard headed, but he's really likable and he plays it really well. And then he has another great dish where he's like, all the small towns sit on your A word jobs are taken. He's killing it to Vickery. And Vickery just is like my town, my case. He still just wants nothing to do with this or Detective Willis. So he's clearly suspicious or he knows something that he's not sharing and covering for someone I believe he truly likes. This whole scene was brilliant storytelling, directing and editing all in one because the way it shows Detective Willis in front of those roses at Natalie's memorial site outside, thinking of Detective Vickery's answer and calling him an A word there. Really, really awesome job. And it shows there was a lot of effort put into this show and how it's edited and how it's thought out when directing a scene like this. So Camille goes to the Keen house. She gets the door slammed in her face and the mother and she runs into John Keen outside in the driveway, he wants nothing to do with her. And she meets now Ashley Wheeler, who she referred to as the Jackie O type last episode. And Ashley Wheeler is like, oh no, I know who you are, Camille. People used to say you were it back in the day. Well, even this girl who's way younger than her knows about Camille, really with no relation. And she basically says she'll hook her up to get an interview with John at her house later. And while she's walking away, Camille checks out her butt. So we're now learning that Camille clearly has interest sexually in females as well, as it was hinted in episode one where she went to comfort looked like an ex-girlfriend, which you learn in this episode. The girl in that bed in episode one's flash was Alice, but this was another big hint to that right there. So we get a nice scene now back in the past with Alice and Camille. And Camille says, lucky you can still wear skirts. I haven't worn skirts since college. So we know Camille's been cutting for a while here and we know that Alice has a particular way of hiding it in certain parts. And we see Camille saying she's never been good at the adult thing and Alice calls her Peter Pan. They're kind of teasing and flirting each other. It's a nice touch to kind of ease the doom and gloom of this show because it cuts the current time 
of Camille thinking about it while driving and she has a smile on her face, which we basically haven't seen yet. So it was nice to see a touch of joy in how much she actually cares about this girl, Alice. And they bond over them both having strict mothers who hated what they wear. So they obviously see a lot of each other and themselves with the cutting and the way they've been abused. And a really nice touch is we learn that Alice got Camille basically into music and that the cracked iPod we keep seeing is Alice's. And this whole time she's listening to the same songs Alice showed her. This scene was really effective and it's two top-notch actresses. So anytime you get something like this, it's a treat to watch. And they both had great chemistry together. So we see Detective Willis and Camille now at a diner and Camille's trying to pull more info out of him. And he's like, what if I don't? You gonna go to Vickery and give him that big eye flirt you are throwing my way? Another great line by Detective Willis. And that also showing that in that particular moment, at least he definitely has a thing for her and she's got his eye on him as well. But I love the cat and mouse game they play with just trying to get information from each other discreetly. And they both agree upon that Vickery is suspicious and basically an idiot. But then Willis is like, I read your articles, I read the sob story, there is no way you were allowed in Natalie's room. So that is already coming to the forefront and he's warning her about it and the whole town knows about this story now, it's out. So I'm sure we're really gonna touch on the effects of that the next episode. And he's like, stay out of my way and he upsets Camille. And she looks at a knife again in the diner. Is it allude to her having cutting feelings or something else? The directing really is great in this show because every single feeling and emotion of each character is portrayed in other things around them to the nitty gritty detail. There's not one moment they let any actor in the show get out of character. Everything is so well thought out and connected that even when there's no speaking going on from a certain character, you're learning more about them while you're hearing the other person speak. It's very fascinating how well they do this. So we get an interesting scene now at Bob Nash's house with Camille and Bob Nash. And an interesting thing Bob Nash tells her is that he originally wanted a kid and his wife didn't. And we still haven't seen the wife. We don't know anything about her, so it's very suspicious on her end too. Where is she right now? And he says the line, how could someone do that to a kid? And Cam says, you talking about your wife or the killer? That of course is gonna set him off. And she brings up that he had DUIs and assault charges before. And he gets offended. He's like, you still, you think that means I killed my da own daughter? And he has a point. And Cam's like, do you still think it was a man who killed your daughter? And he's like, women around here don't kill with their hands. They kill with their talk. And we get another smile from Camille here where she's like, that's true. So she's clearly experienced that in this town for sure. And he just goes on and now puts the blame on John Keen. So everybody's pointing fingers at each other. No one wants to take any responsibility. It's gotta be frustrating Camille to no end. And then to just make it worse, Adora, her mother, walks in. Crazy, crazy psycho woman here. And they throw in a little important line that we learned that Adora tutored Ann Nash who passed away. So we didn't know that and she didn't mention that to Camille. So very interesting. And she really screws over Camille here and makes Camille snap. She's all pissed off driving. And Camille sees Emma rollerblading and follows her. And we see Emma goes to the slaughterhouse at Preaker Farms, and it looks like she sneaks out a pig. Why does she do this? We saw in the beginning of the episode her having that pig loose. Does she feel bad for them? Does she let them go? Or she just want a pet pig? Any theories on this, please let me know. So then we cut to a scene of Adora with Chief Vickery. We learn he's the one who ratted out Camille being at the Nash house after seeing her outside. And Adora's like, I refuse to believe Bob Nash killed his own child. Who would do such a thing? At this point, we're like, the way Adora is choosing her words, it almost sounds like she's subconsciously maybe admitting she did this to her child for people who believe she's the killer and have that theory. I feel like that puts a big light on it more, we'll see. Almost like she's trying to deter anyone thinking about this being a possibility for anyone killing their own kid. And then we see Chief Vickery puts his hand of comfort to Adora, but there's a little more than that, it seems like, because the minute Emma walks in, they both immediately move back. So to add to theories about Adora, or Emma being a part of the murders of this town would make sense to that as Vickery would clearly be the one covering it up because he deeply cares about Adora in a sense. And then we get a really crazy line from Adora where she's telling Emma, you need to be careful around Camille. You are not safe around her. This really makes things crazy in this show. That got me really more interested in this because you don't know who to trust, who's lying. And for Adora to say that about her own daughter to her other daughter, is crazy. What has Camille done in the past that was that bad to make Adora say that? And how is that gonna affect how Emma looks at this sister she was starting to like? So then we see Camille goes to Ashley's house. And of course, Ashley's in a cheerleader outfit. 
And Camille's like, isn't school out? Why are you wearing that? And she's like, oh, just for the spirit of it. There's definitely something going on there where Ashley is alluding to something in Camille's past when she was wearing the cheerleading outfit. And Camille keeps her cool from that because I'm surprised that didn't freak her out. But we learn that John Keene was out driving during the night. Natalie went missing and he admits this. And this also sounds super sketchy. And Ashley knows that. And she's like, no, no, he was with me that night. Clearly lying and trying to cover him. And he also, now the other blame game here, blames Bob Nash and he says, perfect little aunt. There's obviously this town drama between these families that has to connect into why these two were killed in the same time range. But John hates the town. He was an outsider and his girlfriend's nuts. So we learn that more. And it's just adding more confusion to Camille, but I do think from that scene, there's no way John Keane murdered anybody here. You could just tell by the way he's behaving that he is innocent, and they allude to that later on as well. Then we get this beautiful scenery of a small town in the summer, and it's outside Camille's house, and Adora is just laying into Camille here, blaming everything on her, saying she just pretty much hurts everybody, and even accuses her of hurting Emma. Then Adora accidentally cuts her hand on the thorns and she's like look what you've done who thinks like that it had nothing to do with camille but that just proves that the mom is not trustworthy about saying that camille isn't safe or a bad person it's probably herself so thorns symbolize defense loss and thoughtlessness which clearly is what is going on with adora that sums her up perfectly so i definitely there's a reason they had the thorns cut her there and then the rose that we see in this episode a ton which is happening with the mother in the garden getting run over by Emma. And then we saw the rose that Camille was trying to give Alice, which she left on the bed before her suicide. We keep seeing roses as a symbol of balance and it expresses promise, hope, and new beginnings. So I think the rose was used to show that the hope was in Alice and Camille's relationship and the hope and promise of new beginning with each other. And that's why I was so sad the suicide of the rose was on the bed there, almost like a sign of what could have been. And Adora loves roses, but she can't keep them. They got destroyed this episode and she got cut by a thorn. So it's almost like roses don't represent her at all. She's not deserving of this. This isn't who she is, even though she wants it so bad. So props to that writing. And then we get some really powerful lines here. And we go to the past and Alice is crying to Camille and Alice is laying in her bed. And she's like, does it get better with your family? when I'm older like you. And Camille's like, no. And Alice is like, so what do you do? And Camille's like, you survive. And some great acting by Sydney Sweeney here when she's crying, you really feel for her. And we see a really nice side of Camille where she goes and does the puppy eyes for the headphones and knows this is what Alice taught her as a way to escape. And she's like, let's get out of here, which is a great touch to the scene before where Alice was showing her how to do that and music was the way to get out of this trauma. So really good writing there that everything in this episode is connected to each other so well. And that whole feeling of Camille remembering about the iPod and what Alice taught her and her doing it for Alice in a time of need really, to me, sums up true love. What I love they do here is when they transition back to current time with Camille, the song keeps playing and transitions her to listening it in current time and still using it as an escape mechanism. She had learned from Alice. So we see a scene with Adora and her husband, Alan. We start to learn a little bit about him and it's really interesting that they don't sleep in the same room together, him and Adora. And Adora's like, she makes me feel like I did something wrong, referring to Camille, am I a bad mother? So there's some serious guilt she's suppressing there. Almost to the point she has so much guilt that she's now coping with it by deleting it completely, causing her to be psychotic. So then we get Camille and Emma in Camille's room and Emma's basically saying how much she doesn't like Ashley, John Keane's girlfriend. And she's like, parties I can tell he's always staring at me. He definitely likes me. Camille's like, he's a little old for you, don't you think? And she says, not my type, too pretty. So Emma is definitely, definitely a tomboy here and also has a lot of hate and spite in her heart. And we're seeing that come out a lot here in this episode. So then we see that Camille walks to Marion's old room and she finds a used napkin that the mom was using in her ritual of crying on the bed. And it looks like there's an old IV rod still there from when Marion was sick. And then it looks like she appears to see Marion's bloody face in the reflection of the picture of her with Marion as a kid. Such a haunting shot, I loved it. Felt like American Horror Story. The show wasn't billed as a horror show, but it definitely has elements of it. So we see Camille again in a bar with Detective Willis. They both love this bar, clearly. And what I was talking about before where Camille agrees with what I was saying was that John Keane loves his family too much to kill his sister and that he's too sensitive. But Willis said, again, that Natalie wasn't molested. So it still makes him a suspect because if this is a man with the pulling out of the teeth that they're assuming takes super strength 
and adrenaline. It usually comes with some kind of rape, but because it was a brother, obviously there wouldn't be a rape involved. So that's his logic to it. And what's so funny about this is Camille tries to fool him to say a little more about it and, eat, and get more info out of him but he catches on to it clearly. And Willis starts thinking on the right spots as a detective where he's like, tell me about Wind Gap, the old days, and more stuff that could be festering that could lead to these recent murders. And Camille's like, what do I get out of it? And he's like, other than my charming company? So of course he wants to bang her. And Cam's telling him some stuff about the town. They're flirting outside, laying down, really setting up that you think she'd go home with him. But then Emma comes in hot with these other girls rollerblading and two cars behind them. Clearly the boss of her crew and her posse. And she really comes off like a bully here. Literally keeps referring to Detective Willis as Dick instead of his name, Richard. And she's like, it's clearly the hot ticket. You should hear the stories. They are hot. Really just throwing Camille under the bus. She even flirts with Detective Willis. But you can tell Emma becomes a real jerk in front of her friends, like a different person. We've seen that before and a lot of younger people growing up for sure. So she definitely has that as a character trait. Which really is like the boys, all the boys, Camille and sticking a lollipop in her hair, really just laying it on her and totally ruining it for Detective Willis and Camille to possibly have a romantic night together. So she's blocking everyone from enjoyment. And then you feel terrible for Camille and I started to hate Emma here. Camille's driving, drunk, speeding, and then she's had, there's flashes of her thinking about Emma picking on her, really sad. And then what's so brilliant about the show is that recent bullying that happened to her sets off her traumas about Alice and it goes into full effect here. Very realistic to how when someone says something really mean to you as a person or you're really hurt by something, it can trigger other stuff, so well done there. And then we get a little piano playing in the background, we're getting crazy amount of flashes of Alice. So what's brilliant about this is we've never seen inside Camille's mind go this quickly and race like this with flash after flash. That's how it was represented, really cool stuff. Like the feeling I had watching this sequence starting with Alice was like, my heart was racing up to my neck, if that makes any sense. And then we see the inevitable happen where she goes into the room in the past and she finds Alice dead. Looks like there's a bottle of Drano there and there's blood everywhere. I'm not totally sure where the blood came from. I just saw it as her killing herself with Drano. If someone could explain that down below, because that wasn't clear to me how blood was involved, but I took it as she killed herself with the Drano. So sad, she left the rose on the bed that Camille had given her. And Camille immediately goes to the toilet, throws up, grabs the screw, and starts to cut herself. And it's intense and graphic. So if you haven't seen this episode yet, this is a warning for you. It's super graphic and disturbing here. And then Camille's going a hundred in current time on the highway. See spiteful written on the sign of the highway. These are things they use in the show to show how she's thinking. And sees her little sister appear and then behind her, Alice. And then they reveal that she had carved fix in her arm back in the day, which is the title of this episode. What does everyone think that could mean? But she throws the iPod out the window, stops the car, was clearly thinking about killing herself. And to me, that was a big moment for her to throw the iPod out the window because it was like her letting go of Alice a bit, this unhealthy obsession she has with her. So the really interesting thing in this whole amazing sequence at the end is the stepdad listening to music, which he always does. Is it him washing away his demons he has? Because he goes outside and starts to scream like crazy. What the hell does this even mean? What is he screaming about? That confused me so much. If there's a clear answer there, please let me know. If not, what are your theories? But it adds to the mystery and suspense. It was really cool. This was a phenomenal episode for me. It really was a work of art. It had everything, heart, motion, hope, sadness, rage, so many slew of feelings of being human. The show really is so damn human and super heavy incredibly focused. Every little thing is important. It has such a great attention to detail and the acting, writing, directing, top notch again. And the story is very deep and layered and they add more and more layers to it. And we know it's going to ramp up more and more now because we only got four more episodes to go. It is a mini series. So let's see how this wraps. I love this episode. I'm giving it a 9.8, which is really, really high. It was spectacular. It made me feel all types of emotions and what a great effective story, how they showed us everything with Alice and Camille here. Awesome, fascinating stuff to feel that emotion and earn at the end scene with her driving in the highway. And we learned a ton about Emma. And they got a great mystery brewing. So right now it's got everything going. I'm loving this. Let me know what you thought down below the episode. If you're enjoying this season or not as well, please let me know. I respond to everybody. So keep the comments coming. Let's get the discussion going here. Please subscribe. I'm reviewing The Sinner, Better Call Saul, and Castle Rock right now currently. And I've reviewed all The Handmaid's Tale if you want to check that out. And I'll be reviewing a bunch of movies as well. So you don't want to miss any of that. 
and follow me at SteveArley1 on Twitter and Instagram for more, and I'll see you next time.